All right, since it's 12, we're going to go ahead and get started. Thank you so much for joining us for the Hearing Loss Technology Leveling, Leveling the Playing Field webinar. I'm going to go over a few things with you guys before we get started. So for the captions, we have a link in the chat that'll take you to the live captioning portal. This webinar will be recorded and uploaded to the FAST YouTube channel. So make sure to check out our YouTube for any other assistive technology webinars. To help minimize the distractions, everyone else other than the speakers will be muted. So please raise your hand or type in the chat if you have a question. Today, our speakers are Laura Plumer and Heidi Lervik. Laura Plumer is the statewide assistive technology program coordinator for Wisconsin. She's been providing services in the area of hearing loss technology throughout her career. And Heidi Lervik has been the Arizona Technology Access Program for the last six years as a assistive technology specialist. And prior to this, she's worked with many capacities with hearing loss services. So that's all I have, Lauren, Heidi. So whenever you're ready, just go ahead and get started. Great, thank you, Hannah. And hello, everyone in Florida. Um, Heidi and I are actually both in Arizona today. So we we all get palm trees in our, uh, in our views out our windows today. Um, so just to be real quick, um, neither Heidi nor myself have any financial or non-financial relationships with any of the products or services that we are going to be speaking about today. And our objectives today are to demonstrate and discuss technology advancements related to hearing aids. We will also be talking about solutions and strategies related to school, work, home and community access. And then finally, discussing um, the apps that are available for our mobile and smart technologies related to hearing loss. And um, Hannah, we thank you for inviting us to speak today. And um, as you indicated, please feel free to um, pop some questions in the chat. Um, I know Hannah will be keeping an eye and we will as well. Um, otherwise, you can also raise your hand um, and ask your questions as we go through. All right, so we're just beginning this um, discussion, just to highlight some of the complications that we all that have been encountered related to technology and hearing loss over this past year. Um, hopefully in another year, we won't need to have this slide on our presentation, um, but some of the complications and things that have impacted um, and the new considerations regarding technology for hearing loss um, is obviously the increased um, or almost exclusive use of video and telecommunications for communications, both on work or school related. Um, the, the access and capabilities of um, our equipment and our homes to connect with um, the internet and can, to be able to handle those new technologies has been a, a factor to consider. Um, some of the, the meeting platforms and their limitations. So, you know, we're on GoToMeeting today, but we have other platforms like Zoom, Skype, Teams, and each one has their own little um, different take on accessibility. We have to consider things like auditory and visual access in all venues, um, the awareness and then the advocacy to speak up for your rights and your communication needs. Um, the, the very complicated um, communication impacts of masks, plexiglass, um, and then the social distancing. So we just need to kind of highlight that those are some of the lenses in which we need to look at technology, um, both this past year and as we move forward into the future. Now I'll let Heidi take over. Yeah. Thanks, Laura. Um, Hannah, thank you again, too, for letting us uh, present. I was going to say good morning to everybody, but it's um, it's afternoon for you all in uh, Florida. So this slide just kind of shows all the different types of hearing aids out there. It, it really varies with size and what the hearing aids can do. Um, there's one of the things when we talk about hearing aids too, we have to determine what's going to be the most appropriate hearing aid for that person. What's their hearing loss? Um, hearing aids have really become um, a great assistive technology. People, um, if they have mobility issues, 
you might um, want to think about different issues. There's behind the ear, there's in the canal, there's full canal. But if um, maybe you have Parkinson's or maybe you've had a traumatic brain injury, a lot of times mobility, it's hard to put those hearing aids on. A lot of our seniors have a hard time putting hearing aids in and on. So there's different types of hearing aids that we can use for that. Some of the hearing aids now even have fall detection. So if a senior maybe is wearing one and um, has fallen, it um, is alerted. Um, directional microphones, uh, to shut the microphones in the back to get the background noise off. Uh, the, the control of the buttons, we're gonna kind of show you more um, of how the, the hearing aids work. They even have a Lyric hearing aid where it can be placed inside the ear by an audiologist. And um, and then the battery is only changed out two to three months, so they don't have to worry about trying to take it in, put it out. Um, so this really helps people with dementia or mobility. I'm going to talk a little bit more about Bluetooth um, streamers. These hearing aids really do do um, have various capabilities. So next slide, please. These are um, examples of cochlear implants and Baja implants. Uh, these are two surgical options. Uh, the cochlear implant, the top left, um, is for, usually for sensual neuro, neural hearing loss, and a lot of times people will call it nerve deafness. An electrode is put through inside the, the cochlea to stimulate it, and um, it's kind of like sound filter for your ear. And then you wear a processor that kind of looks like a hearing aid that is on the outside and there's a magnet with that electrode inside and that's how that stays on. And then on to the right, that is a Baja implant. This is often used for somebody that has single-sided deafness, um, a conductive loss or mixed. And um, a lot of times people may not be born with an outer ear or an inner ear. So this is um, a processor that is used to take sound in and vibrates through the bone and that sound goes into the cochlea. And um, so it just kind of bypasses any damaged part. So if you have no outer ear or the, the three little middle bones, it bypasses that. And with our kiddos, they, they can't have the Baja surgery until they're five. And so there's a sound arc and there's also soft bands that they will use and put the processor on to get the sound. Next slide. So with hearing aids, one of the options is having a T coil or telephone call, a coil inside of the hearing aid. Um, it's really tiny tiny device and basically it's just a wireless antenna. Um, the T-coil turns off the mic and then it picks up this electromagnetic signal that um, turns sounds, that turns and makes sounds. So it just kind of eliminates the squealing. And not every hearing aid can have a T-coil because some hearing aids are just too small to put a t-coil in and often and laura and i run into this a lot when you're trying to help someone that wants help deciding what maybe assist a listening device that they can use for their hearing aid is most people don't even know what a t-coil is or oh, do i have one in my hearing aid or and sometimes they already have one in but it's not turned on and this is something that the audiologist or hearing aid dispenser would turn on. So the T-coils um, are often used um, with students. Um, they can have the T-coil on a microphone and um, they have it kind of on a T-coil and microphone. So now they'll, they'll hear the teacher speaking through maybe an FM system, but now they can also hear the students around them if they're asking a question. And um, people that 
use a T-coil can also, if um, many times your theaters or churches, I know our office, our lobby, we have um, a looped system. So it's, it's a wire that you can't see in our ceiling. So if you walk into our lobby, you turn the T-coil on your hearing aid, you're gonna hear our receptionist ask you questions. Our training room has that, our lab has that. Um, it's it's very um, clear sound and it's nice for people now they don't have to use another device. And this T-coil, you know, some people, they can do it manually on their hearing aid. Some use their, their phones to turn it on. Um, some, some of times it just automatically turns on when there's a loop. So again, all these hearing aids will vary. Next slide. So Bluetooth, um, I'm sure most of you are familiar what, what Bluetooth is, but it is a wireless communication that allows for the transfer of data. For data. So it's like a platform for data between two electronic devices. And with Bluetooth, hearing aids now, Sometimes they have only Bluetooth. We've been finding a lot that people aren't even sometimes given the option to have a T-coil and they'll have Bluetooth. Well, this is a great resource. It really has been a game changer for people, but um, sometimes people need both. And when you do use Bluetooth, you're also going to need a streamer and that kind of provides the communication link between the technology of the hearing aids and the Bluetooth device. And I'll talk a little bit more about that as well. Um, so you really need to pair the streamer to um, like to the phone, to your hearing aids. And um, it this sometimes can be difficult because you have to consider the distance of, you know, and the purpose of using the Bluetooth. Are you going to try to Bluetooth your um, hearing aids maybe to the computer? Um, you know, it's nice Bluetooth to your, maybe to your telephone. It can be to an iPad. So there's, there's so many, many devices now that use Bluetooth. Um, they have little mini mics. When Laura kind of started talking at the the beginning too with plexiglass, I'm working with a young woman as a bank teller and she has a hearing loss and now they have plexiglass up. Everyone's still wearing masks here in Arizona and it was very, very difficult for her. So she doesn't have a T-coil. So hers, her hearing aids are Bluetooth. So then we set up like a little mini mic outside the plexiglass so now her customers can talk into this mini mic and and she hears it directly into her hearing aid. So she's kind of bypassing that whole plexiglass and not being able to read their lips. Um, let's go to the next slide. So these are just some examples of streamers and dongles. So again, this is the, the go between device um, um, that can be hung around a neck, sometimes they're placed in a pocket. Um, this, these can be paired again with all kinds of devices. There's a dongle on the kind of bottom right hand corner. That dongle um, has been used a lot for educators. It's um, it's like makes the, the streaming more reliable in computers that, um, so it's going directly into your hearing aid. Another thing that we kind of found difficult too is that um, a lot of kiddos, now that we're, you know, having school at home, the parents, especially if they were little, like in, you know, elementary school, kindergarten, that we had to use audio jack splitters for the parents because, the children might be able to hear it, but now the parents can't hear it. So we'd have to use a splitter so the parents could put a headphone on and listen. Um, so um, there, the two of the streamers there are a Compilot and a MyLink. The MyLink uses the T-coil. The so again, these devices are all used with the hearing aids. So they kind of help pair 
and 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 so you could hear what's on the device and whether it's a iPad, a computer, or your smartphone. Next slide. And this just kind of shows you um, your phone being a streamer. So now your phone is talking to your hearing aids and um, it's now your remote. So people now are able to control the volume on their phone. Um, maybe they have different programs. They might have a program that if I'm in a noisy restaurant, I can just change my program or now I'm gonna program it to where I'm watching TV. Um, one thing about Apple, because sometimes I get frustrated because they don't play well with others, but Apple does a really good job with accessibility. And um, if you haven't kind of played around and looked at the accessibility settings for Apple products, you might want to do that. But the phone literally does become the streamer for the hearing aids. Next and question. Heidi, oh. Heidi, this is Laura. I was, was going to add that um, on last week was Global uh, Accessibility Awareness Day. Uh -huh. um, and Apple did some announcements of some new accessibility features within their product, and one related to um, the ability to import your audiogram and make adjustments to your sound based on that. So I don't know if it's live yet. Um, but that was announced last week along with a few other new accessibility features being incorporated. Oh my gosh, I did not hear that. That is awesome. That's great news. Good. Yeah, and one other one was that if you contact Apple support, so normally people would go into the store, like the Apple store and work with a um, one of the um, staff members, I think they're called the Apple genius techs or whatever. Um, they've actually now have dedicated sign language. So if you communicate in ASL, you now have the ability to talk to customer support um, at Apple using your native language. Awesome. See, they just get better and better. They do. Yes. So, and then this kind of just shows um, a picture of um, how you want to um, control your streamer. Uh, you control the right ear, the left ear to adjusting it to maybe um, what you need. Um, and there, there, these are some options for you. You know, again, the auditoriums, a lot of your theaters will have a loop, um, your office. So these are just different offers options that can be programmed into your telephone. And most hearing aids now do, um, they are capable of pairing with a, with a telephone. So these are, um, these are questions that we always have to ask. And, you know, before I even try to do a meeting with someone, I ask them to please find out a lot of these questions. Like, you know, what, what kind of hearing aid do you have? Um, do you, you know, how old is it? Do you know if you have a telephone coil? Are they Bluetooth? Um, because often when somebody gets a hearing aid, it's overwhelming. You have a hearing loss and you get so much information. It's pretty overwhelming that um, you, you don't remember them saying, oh, assisted listening devices, I can hook something up to my hearing aids so I can hear the TV. Um, what a T-coil, what was that again? What was that all about? So these are all the questions that we like to ask people before we start working with them. And because it makes it a lot easier to be able to suggest what assistive technology will work best with them. And, um, and often too, a lot of the devices I didn't mention are proprietary. So if I have phone act hearing aids, I might only be able to use assisted listening devices, maybe that phone act needs. But so these are a lot of questions that we have to ask um, before really sitting down and trying to help somebody. Um, maybe, you know, whether it's assisted listening device or maybe they're first time users for hearing aids, what questions? should they ask their um, audiologist or their hearing aid dispenser. Perfect. 
Um, so on this slide, we have some various images of um, headsets. So sometimes we're working with individuals that um, do not have hearing aids, they may choose not to, um, or they can't afford them for various reasons. So whenever the next section that um, Heidi is going to talk about are listening devices. And so when we use other technology beyond the hearing aid um, for communication, say in a classroom or a theater, we still have to get sound from whatever device that is into someone's ears. Um, and so on the upper left, we've got uh, a set of what are called behind the head headphones. So these allow someone that doesn't go over the top of their head, it kind of rests along their neck. Um, and that can be helpful for someone that maybe has neck or um, head fatigue. We've got some, a single ear headphone. We've got an under the chin headphone, which is on the bottom in the middle. Um, we also have some full blown, um, and those are actually Bose um, quiet comfort Bluetooth headphones. So um, we do take a look at, you know, over the counter brands, I like to call that, um, because sometimes someone can benefit from using that if they can't use a hearing aid or again, can't afford it. Um, but two of the ones, there is a splitter that Heidi mentioned. And then on the upper right is um, the Aftershock foam conduction headset. And I do like to hi highlight this because um, for many individuals, um, they either aren't comfortable with regular headsets or they maybe have ear wax, they may have hairy ears. Um, that's the case of a good friend of mine. And so, and he doesn't have hearing aids. And so I said, hey, try these phone conduction. And what they do is they sit behind the head and then rest just above the ears. And it transmits sound um, via phone conduction, like that Baja that Heidi referenced. And these are about, about $80. They have a mini one that goes for smaller heads. Um, but they were designed for sports so that it allows people that are out running or riding bike or what have you they can actually hear the environment for safety, but then they can still hear their music or podcast. Um, but I have been recommending these quite frequently. Um, I just had someone that is an insurance agent. And so she was having difficulty with all the virtual meetings, even though she has hearing aids. Um, they weren't, she couldn't get the streamers to work with their phone system um, or their conference teleconference system. So she ended up doing these phone conduction headset and it's been working great. And then the other set device on the lower right is just a, um, a pair of small waterproof um, Bluetooth earbuds that um, I personally use. And they are, they last like eight hours, um, but they're, they're small enough that they're, um, they're not going to get knocked out or, um, you know, so we can take a look at what Bluetooth earpieces are available, but, in theory, most of the devices that we'll cover also have a 3.5 millimeter jack, which means you can plug any headphones in. And then I think this is you, Heidi. Yeah. So the neck loop, this is when, again, the the um, the T coil is going to come in, in place. So again, that T coil picks up that electrical magnetic signal that makes now it into sound that you're hearing through your hearing aids. And um, these are just different options now. These would hang around your neck. Um, there's a quattro, the top left one. This will, this does quite a bit. Um, again, it's, you know, it's, it's a neck loop, it streams, but you can answer your phone with this device. Um, you can use it um, kind of as a, a FM system to hear things. Um, the bottom one to the left is just a hook that um, it goes up against your hearing aid and then that's closer to the T coil. And that is just a single one that can be on. These neck loops are great. Um, but again, if it's children, you have to really be careful because if they're very, very small, um, you don't want to place them on them, especially in school. Um, to the very far right is a Phonak Roger receiver. This is a device that gets plugged in. Sometimes they, it depends on um, if your hearing aid has an audio shoe that can it be booted onto, or sometimes it can be booted on um, to another streamer. 
this is again kind of coming back to that proprietary um, um, devices that work with particular hearing aids or implants and um, but this that Roger receiver kind of helps then other devices to be able to use maybe such as a Roger pen Roger receiver. Okay, Laura. Yeah, so as you can tell, um, there's a lot of um, individuality um, regarding hearing aids, um, audio inputs, and so it is important to sit down and make those decisions um, with whatever information you can gather from the individual um, or for yourself. So I'm gonna transition a little bit to um, the video and some speech to text information here. So, um, this slide just kind of highlights the various um, accessibility options with captioning and with um, whether it's automatic or third party. And we're going to talk about kind of the difference between automatic and um, and human powered um, captioning. And I actually don't even have a coded meeting on here. Um, so this, but this just goes to show that some platforms um, allow you to bring in a, a human. Um, being to provide that cart as part of it. Otherwise, some do not. So we're on GoToMeeting, and GoToMeeting does not allow us to put captioning as part of what we're presenting. So then Hannah has captioning being provided by a third party, a human being, and she provided a link to stream text. So um, all the various parts um, platforms have different options related to accessibility. Um, so when we're talking about video meetings, um, there are responsibilities of the host, so the person that sets up the meeting or the webinar, and then there's some participant responsibilities. So it really takes takes two to communicate, not only in person, but on video. Um, so a host is responsible for obtaining interpreters, um, obtaining captioners, making sure their materials, the handouts are accessible um, for anyone maybe using a screen reader, um, going through meeting prompts, um, describing what is, if, you know, if, as a presenter, um, Heidi and I are describing what is being shown on that screen. Um, I can spotlight an interpreter, which means that if my video is on, um, then I can spotlight the interpreter to make sure the interpreter's video is large enough for someone to use. Um, and then going through, you know, housekeeping, like, use the chat, say your name when you speak, things like that. Um, the participant is responsible for understanding how to also learn and use that same platform. So how do they pin a video so that it stays visible to them at all times? How do they change those views from one big square to seeing everybody in little squares, um, making sure their audio and video settings are working as well as whatever technology they're using to connect. So. Is it a Bluetooth device? Um, is their hearing aid connected? Um, and then there is a link here for accessibility in Zoom, just to give you an overview. And I see there is a message that, is there a way to have captions on the same screen? In GoToMeeting, there is not, but in these other platforms, there can be. So Zoom um, and Teams and I, I believe can all have that captioning on the same screen at that same time. So speaking of captioning, um, we're going to talk about speech to text. So this is a speech to text is a is an umbrella term, and it's defined as spoken word converted into a text format. And we have various um, ways in which we can do that. So um, on the screen, I'm, I have cart, text translation, and automatic, and we're going to run through each of those just to give you an idea of what that, what's the meaning behind those three. But first on the screen, I have um, a puzzle piece that has a story written on it and parts of the puzzle are missing. And so on here, this story, and you can put in the chat if you're able to read and tell me what this story is about. But right now, the puzzle is about 75% complete. And I'm not seeing anyone typing, so I'm guessing nobody's getting what this says yet. So let's bump up the percent. So here we have 85%. So you can start to get a few more words. 
you can say she loved to jump. You see the word morning and eat big and then butt, but you still really don't know what it says. So let's bump it up to 90%. So that's getting there. We can maybe figure out part of that story. And, and I think I hear someone typing, so I'm not sure if um, someone came off of mute. Um, but then let's go to 100%. So when you see the 100%, and the point of this is to explain that sometimes um, a meeting host or an employer or a provider or a school might say, well, it's close enough to use, say, automatic captioning. But close enough might be that 75%, and we still didn't get a whole lot of it. So accuracy is very important when we are taking a look at captioning. All right, and I'm still hearing um, some noise. I just don't want Hannah's recording to get messed up. Um, so CART, um, which is Communication Access Real-Time Translation. So this is human powered. Um, it's, a, it's a service that you pay for, and it's a verbatim transcript of what is being communicated. And these are trained providers. They generally are um, court reporters using stenography machines. And um, when we use them for a presentation on virtual, then we actually can add them as a third party into that meeting. So in Zoom, I click and I assign um, that CART provider to do that captioning for me. Um, it can also be done live. So back in the future days, when we're all back in person, you could maybe have, um, and on the screen is an image of someone providing live CART. Um, and we have CART being provided through Stream Text now um, via the web link that Hannah provided. We also have um, another type of translation, which is text translation. So this is, again, translating spoken content um, to print. It is human powered. And this too is fee based. However, this is more conceptual. It's not necessarily verbatim. And CPrint and TypeWell are two of the most common ways in which this is done. They are trained, um, but the, with, with CPrint and TypeWell, they're using more of um, some programming and keyboard shortcuts. And so you may get just a, a summary. Um, it's still fairly complete, but it's not verbatim with all the ums and hmms that a speaker might say. And so these are just, this on screen is just an example. So um, Mary had a little, little lamb, it sleeps as white as snow. Uh, Mary had a lamb that's white. So on the left would be your cart, and on the right might be your text translation. So it's more of a summary. And when, this, when you need to consider that is maybe you have a student that is going to school, and they're taking um, a biology class, and they're taking a philosophy class. Now, if I'm taking biology, I probably want CART because I want accuracy. I want, I need to know how to spell the words, I need to know all the definitions, I need that accuracy. If it's an open flow philosophy class that's very conceptual, text translation might do the trick. And then lastly, we have automated speech recognition. And this is, has really, really um, become the rage this past year um, with the demand for virtual services. So this is using artificial intelligence or AI, and it converts the text or the speech to text. Um, if you have a newer version of PowerPoint, you can enable that and you can actually pull up a PowerPoint and play around with it. Check it out, see how it does. Um, Zoom provides this to all accounts. So you can have a paid provider or you can do the free, um, but it really relies on the speaker's voice quality. Um, the microphone, the bandwidth, the background noise, um, all of that. And so, or the vocabulary. Um, I did a presentation on COVID and I literally counted, I think, nine different ways that the automated captions tried to figure out what I was saying with COVID. And then last week I did a presentation and used the, it was a recording, so I 
used the PowerPoint automated transcription. And no matter how many times I use the word assistive technology, and then I shorten it to AT, every single time it heard that as the number 80, it could never get it right. So that could have a big impact on the meaning of something I'm saying um, for a participant that is deaf or hard of hearing. And then there are some captioning websites and um, Web Captioner is a free site. It has to be done in the browser, not on a smart device. So no tablets or phone. Um, it's, it's pretty darn good. So if you are maybe sitting down with somebody um, and you're needing to communicate and you've got a laptop available, you could pull this out and then it can caption for you. So maybe it's just a short conversation with someone. Um, Microsoft Translate is available, um, and then Otter AI is another uh, long-standing um, product. They have free and paid versions, and that is an app that you can utilize. And it is actually what's behind the Zoom platform um, for their free captions. And then there's a couple other caption apps. Um, and again, you'll get this handout, so you're welcome to click through. These apps tend to change every now and then. Um, so live caption is the image on the screen, and that one allows up to a couple, like maybe a minute or so, and it's it's pretty accurate. Um, I've done some testing with that. Um, so some of these are paid, some are free. Um, AVA is utilized in, I've known several people that use AVA, so they'll give a Bluetooth microphone to the speaker, and then it will be translated using automated captions to their smartphone. And I already kind of mentioned this is just the slide based auto caption. So the version of the both PowerPoint and Google slides have this. Um, and I described how the accuracy can vary. Um, but I did watch someone use this and the captions covered up all of the lower content. Uh, the like the last bottom line on every slide for that person. Um, and the other thing is it if it's used on a virtual in a webinar, if I had it running today, if you were someone distracted by captions um, or had a learning disability where that um, impacted your ability to focus, you may you can't turn them off. So if I'm putting them on there, then you have no control. You can't make them bigger, you can't make them smaller. So there's some negatives to those slide-based captions. And then just a couple more slides on videos and the captioning related to that. Um, so open caption means that the captions are just there. You can't turn them on or off. Um, we have closed captions and those are what we see on television. Um, what we might see when we are, depending on, um, a video that is uploaded. And then we have automated. And so I know when Hannah will upload this, she is going to use the transcript provided by the captioner, and then she'll go in and make all the corrections and line it up so that whenever what we're saying lines up with what we're speaking, the captions line up with what we're saying. Um, and then YouTube does have automated captions available. It's not the greatest, but it's a start. Um, so it's just important that if you are going to share information um, to a wide audience, it's it's very um, beneficial to include captioning. And I think we already kind of covered that. So I'm going to hop through. Um, so when you're you're deciding on what you know, if you're using something on for remote um, cart, you know, you have to think about in the platform. So are you having a meeting versus a webinar? So for today, because we're not using video. If you're a speech reader, you're kind of out of luck. You're not able to look at us as speakers. Um, think about those screen sharings and how that will impact the size of captions. Um, and then always practice, especially if you're the host and setting something up related to virtual meetings. Um, or if you're attending one and you've never done it, ask the host if you guys can connect first so that you can practice. Um, so you don't miss any of the con content by having to learn the platform at the same time. And then two other quick slides um, on just computer access and the accessibility features that exist. 
So we've got links to the Microsoft accessibility options as well as Apple. And we also have the accessibility for Google and then a couple of links for some hand, the handouts related to um, apps that are available. And I think I'm ready to turn it over to Heidi. Right. So um, there are so many, many different telephone access options. Um, if uh, if you, Oops. we're going to kind of, yeah, Oop, there we go. Easier there. So these are just some different um, things that can be added to a phone to the top left is a um, kind of like a sound booster. It controls the volume. Sometimes people might need it louder, softer, but also tone. You know, somebody might have, um, they don't hear high frequencies, they don't hear low frequencies. So it adjusts. Um, the one right to it, that is like an older version one that also can do the, the bass and the treble. Um, many, many phones now um, are amplified. So there's different types of amplification you can um, you can get if uh, when we were talking about um, like signing and, and relay. So down on the bottom left is a as a TTY. You rarely, rarely even see those anymore. Um, I know our office still has one. Has it been used in the last five years? Probably not. Um, and um, there's different um, amplifiers for the phones as well, um, for boosting, um, for getting, maybe you need something um, with larger print. Um, the cell phone down there now is video relay and it's nice now if someone is deaf, they can just go around with their, with their smartphones and call a friend and you're just video relay, you're using sign language to communicate. And then we also have the caption phone calls and there's different caption um, uh, companies. There's a uh, caption call, uh, clear caption, and oh, I always forget. Um, uh, oh, Captel. Captel, yes, and I probably use that one the most. <laughs> Sorry about that, Captel. And um, it's From nice. My home state. I know, and I apologize for that, Laura. Uh, <laughs> this, uh, uh, these phones are are nice because again, you can make. I think there's another slide where I'll get more detail how this works, but you know you can make the font larger. Maybe you need a yellow background. You know there's um, you can keep your message on there. Um, this is used a lot um, for people, and I think I think we have a slide here that I'll kind of talk more yeah. about that. These are just other devices. Um, um, you know some of the the telephones too that they're not only um, used for hearing, you know, um, but also for vision, you know, maybe I'm someone who's gotten older now, I've lost my hearing, but now I'm having a difficult time seeing those numbers. So there are larger print numbers. They have telephones now too, of maybe some cognition issues where it's just a picture of a person. So I've pressed the picture of maybe my daughter, it'll, it'll call. Um, maybe it's, uh, um, you know, the neighbor next door. So it's pictorial instead of having to remember a phone number. Um, down below are two types of answering machines. You know, when you have a hearing loss, it's, it's a nightmare when someone leaves a message or you're taught, you know, listening to automated because people just speed through their phone number. And these two machines down here, you can slow down the voice while you're playing your message. And that's a nice thing too about the caption phones is that people can leave a message and now you can read it and look at it too if I missed a word. So next slide. Um, these are two devices that um, deafblind um, individuals would, um, would use. The one on the left is a um, Braille Sense, and this this is a, a great machine. It's like a note taker. 
Um, you can hook it up to iOS devices, Android, Windows, Mac. Um, it's, you know, phone, tablet. Um, it kind of does everything except probably your laundry. And um, so a lot of students will use this. A lot of business um, individuals will use this type of device. Um, it stores all your information. Um, it even has like GPS. Um, so down below is, is the Braille, um, down where the darker area is where you would um, feel the dots on there. The intratype, that also um, is kind of like a deaf-blind communication system. It's uh, anybody can be online and, and it's face-to-face. -face. It's Bluetooth. Um, you can communicate with the person. It could be someone you know, in the next room, in the next state, or they could be sitting right next to you, and now I'm communicating with you one-on-one. -on -one. It's just um, a communication system through, like, internet and using Bluetooth. So the caption phones that we were talking about, um, they, they are... Um, free to folks. Um, I, I think most states have their telephone program. They can help you with it. All the ATAC programs can help you um, get a phone. This is um, a telephone. Again, you're going to need the analog system for this. Um, if you do, and then you also have Wi-Fi, it's, it's great because people automatically just call you. They don't even know you have a caption phone. Um, the the caption, whatever the caller is saying, if I'm the person that needs the caption phone, whatever the caller is saying to me, there is a live person there then rewording all the information that the caller is telling me. So if I, maybe I can still hear somewhat, but then I missed, you know, did you say 50 or 15? You know, sometimes that's really hard when you have a hearing loss. So now I look and it's like, no, I'll meet you in 15 minutes. And, you know, that's better than, oh, geez, I thought it was 50 minutes. And um, so, and, you know, everything is very private with the, um, with the service. Um, it's um, again, there's three different companies that use this and they all have their um, little pros and cons of each phone. It's just what the individual would like. And Next there's another slide. picture. Yeah. Yeah. So again, I'm actually working with someone right now that has caption phones. Again, with COVID, she's working partly at home. She's working some in the office. And so I'm connecting her to the Hamilton CapTel web-based captions. And um, she is an intake person for um, one of our government programs. And it's hard for her to try to do an intake and try to type and listen and then also have to read the captions. So now with Hamilton-based captions, she's able to keep everything on her computer and go back and then fill in her, her sheets. Um, you can also use this on, you know, your cell phones. Um, so this this has been great for those working. Um, and, and sometimes it gets a little tricky depending on, you know, what kind of phone service that you're using at work. But I tell you, um, I was on a, a three-way call with CapTel just the other day and, and really doing a lot of troubleshooting. And they're, it's, a, it's a great program. And then the, the relay service, um, again, that is a free service for um, individuals. Um, if, uh, if you're deaf and you want to do video relay, if I'm deaf and I'm signing to a video relay operator, I'm signing to them and now they're voicing to the person who I'm calling um, and then vice versa. Whatever the caller is saying to the relay operator, they're signing it to me. And um, or I, if I've got the re video relay um, camera in my office, I can now just call maybe a client who is deaf, and we'll both just sign at the same time. 
So it's um, it can be internet or by phone based. So again, this kind of just shows a little example of the person signing to the operator and then the operator signing back and then voicing to the person. Next. So video relay services versus video remote interpreting are two big differences and um, you don't want to get them, them mixed up. So video relay services is just what I was talking about. It's a part of the telecommunications program. There's no cost to, to the person using it. Um, you can use this with, with your video phones, computers, smartphones, and tablets, but um, you use to make the, um, the communication is through that relay. A lot of times, you know, this is, every state has the video relay service. It's part of your 911 excise tax. Um, at least it is here in Arizona. Video remote interpreting is a whole different ball game. This is where you are charged for using it. So if I needed um, to, let's say a lot of hospitals use this often. So if they've got a patient that has come in and they can't get a live interpreter, they do this a lot with the um, out in the remote areas that they will have the person, then um, the patient will be looking like at a tablet or a computer and there is an interpreter signing to them and answering and helping with the questions. Now that is charged usually, at least in Arizona, it's charged by minute by you're using it. And um, so that and that's just even used, like if we were doing, um, if we had an interpreter right now for this um, presentation, we would be charged for, for uh, remote interpreting. So that's that's the big difference there that the one does charge and the other one is totally free and they figure out pretty quick if you're trying to use relay in the same room with somebody else yes yes they do <laughs> which is a violation of the FCC yes <laughs> good point Laura uh, so there are so so many signaling devices um, there you know Things to alert us can be um, visual, we can hear it, it can be loud, they can have lights that flash. Um, this has been kind of hard too with COVID with people at home. You know, they're on their computers and maybe they're using that T-coil or a headset and now I didn't hear the doorbell, you know, and you know, maybe there's there's kids on their computers and there's a lot of extra noise, a lot of things going on. Um, so signaling devices can be really important. The top left one is just, a, um, I think it's a sonic boom alarm clock. It can be plugged into a lamp that'll flash when the alarm goes off. Um, there's a bed shaker that um, I always say it looks like a hockey puck that you would put, put under your pillow to wake you up. Um, it's very loud. And again, you can change the volume, the tone on that. To the right of it, it's an alert system that you could use with multiple things, your alarm clock, doorbell, um, uh, your baby sleeping, uh, the smoke detector, the telephone. Um, so all of these things um, have different types of things of, of alerting you. Um, the one on the bottom left, or like the the first three on the bottom are flashing devices. So when you see that flashing, you will know, is it my telephone? Is it is it my doorbell? And the two bottom left, um, left to right, those two are, are pagers that are tactile. They'll vibrate. Um, if I'm deaf blind, um, it's got, um, it's, uh, I can feel it tactile, it'll tell me, is it the baby crying? Um, there's different vibrations to how you set it up. And again, it'll let you know, is it the phone? Is it the baby? Is it the doorbell? Um, I just got this, the system on the right, the Serene, all set up to be shipped out today to someone. And um, and that can be worn. It, you can carry it around with you, you can put it in your pocket, you can clip it on your clothing, your belt. 
Um, so these are all visual. Um, the cell phone too that you see on there, that can alert, I can set it to alert me if I get a text message, phone call, maybe I want to set it to, I, I got an email and um, it also charges it as well. And that cradle will work with a flip phone. I've set them up with a flip phone before. Oh, you have? And oh, I mean, and it I does work. Oh, gosh. It has enough vibration to make it go. I'm going to have to make a note of that. Yeah. Great. Um, yeah. So this slide is just some more signaling options. Um, you know, the smoke and fire alarms, um, those are kind of on the lower left um, and middle and the bottom. Um, we've got an image of, I think it was, is it the, was it the ditto? D ditto, the, yep. The ditto with an X through it, because just to show that sometimes we get really cool devices and then they get discontinued. So sometimes they're just not all, um, you know, we get pretty excited about it, but then they, the manufacturer quits doing it. Um, the one that we wanted to highlight, and I can't remember if I have a screenshot of it. Um, I have to move my thing here. Nope, I don't. Um, is that in the Apple Watch, um, and maybe I do in another slide, but on the Apple Watch. Laura, it's in, a, in our another slide. Okay. All right. So this just shows there's a decimal meter on that. So um, it provides the wearer with an alert if a sound in their environment near them um, reaches a certain volume level. And um, yesterday we had a all staff meeting and one of the staff whose staff was presenting. And so she was able to use this alert to know that her dog was barking in the background. Um, and that also shows the next slide too. So yeah, there's just a variety of options out there. All right. Okay. Yeah. So here's the next one is um, with your iPhones, and I don't know if Androids do it because I'm not an Android user, uh, but they now allow on your Apple iOS device to set up um, sound recognition for specific things. So on the screen is an image of my phone. Um, indicating a sound that has been recognized that may be a cat. So every morning, literally, my phone has this image on it because my cat wakes me up for food at 5 a.m. by meowing loudly. Um, and then the last signaling device is the, is the dog that you'll see on that screen. So people have um, hearing ear dog. And this is the slide, Heidi, that doesn't have your dog in it like it was supposed to. My apologies. That's we okay. Have yours. <laughs> um, and then we can use smart technology too um, as a way to, to be alerted. So again, I've got an, I, an I, Apple Watch, um, got an image of a ring doorbell, but also the Nest system and the Nest app. So, um, you know, I can be alerted to things in my environment um, by using standard smart home technology and the cameras that go with that. I can also use the GPS um, features within my phone or other um, devices with the if this then that app. And so what that can do is if I have some smart light bulbs in my home and I am deaf or hard of hearing and I don't wanna come into a dark house um, just for safety, I can set those smart light bulbs up to turn on when I reach the end of my street. So that then it will turn the lights on and I'm going into a well-lit home. So we can use that this smart technology to solve some solutions around deaf, hard of hearing. And I think this is your slide, I believe. Yeah, these are just some other, you know, tech solutions. Um, oh, I guess I just... Uh... And then um, the clear uh, face masks have been very handy. Um, our, the Arizona Commission for Deaf and Hardy Hearing gave out a lot of these this year during COVID um, for communication, um, a whiteboard just for writing. Um, I don't know if any of you have done like a boogie board too. It's like just you can write it and erase it real quick. Um, again, it kind of shows that plexiglass I'm um, just using a device to show, okay, I'm going to type something, you're going to read it and be able to, to see it. And that if you can't hear my voice and um, a lot of times they'll have the microphone um, 
that can be used outside of it. So if somebody then is in that looped room, they can also use this mic. And Laura, I think you had an example of an ice cream shop that they were using that. Yeah, yeah. so a local ice cream parlor last summer installed plexiglass for all their employees and they weren't, um, I don't know if any of them had hearing loss, but you know, all the ice cream was, they'd have to have their back to the customer while they were scooping the ice cream. And so this comp this business just set up these boom mics all along the row where people would come up to the counter to order. And then the staff all had headsets so they could hear without everybody having to shout. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of different. Uh, and let me go to the next one. All right. So I think this slide isn't supposed to be on there, but I don't know. Um, I think the, you know, some considerations that we have at the very end, um, you know, regarding, you know, thinking, always having a plan A and a plan B when it comes to the technology um, and how we're using it. And obviously we are, have learned that bandwidth is very, very crucial to our lives. Um, and considering, you know, what's the lighting, what is background noise, um, and then working with employers, um, if it's a work-related situation, um, explain why a certain solution may be best, and then increase productivity as well as um, communication access and morale, you know, for staff. And then we do have, um, Really extensive list of resources um, that are available. And again, we'll be sending this over to Hannah so she can include that for those that are attending. Um, but we've got links to the, the Assistive Technology Act programs, the I Can Connect program, which is technology and training for individuals with um, combined hearing and vision. And then each state does have a telecommunication equipment distribution program. And just some other various resources. And then um, if you've got questions, we do have our contact information available. So anything else to add, Heidi? No, no, just appreciate you all letting us talk and, and please feel free to reach out to us. Um, kind of went through everything quite quickly and if you have more questions, you know, please ask and if we don't know the answer, we'll find one for you. And thanks again, Hannah, and everyone in Florida. Yeah, thank you, Hannah. Thank you, guys. This was great. A lot of great knowledge. Um, when I saw it at ATIA, I had to share it with Floridians. It was such great, great content. Um, like I said in the beginning, this will be posted to our YouTube page. It does take um, a little bit of time to get it on the website, but if you subscribe to our YouTube channel, you'll get a notification when we post it. Um, I'll put my email in the chat if you wanted to reach out about a copy of the PowerPoint as well. Oh. And I went ahead and stopped sharing. Okay. Thanks again, Hannah. Yeah, of course. Thank you. Have a great day. Thanks. Okay, Everyone you too. Bye-bye. Yep,